we lead to the next talk uh, by dr rajiv which uh, will be systemic Nani? hello systemic pyramid and uh, medical management yeah thanks sir thank yes, you yes. sir can you yes. see my slides yes yes please carry on i thank uh, professor ajaz dr lalit verma and dr eli and the team for inviting me to give this talk on the assessment of systemic parameters and the medical management in diabetic retinopathy one second i'll just reduce this yeah so uh, diabetic retinopathy is a microvascular complications and uh, and that suggests that it also involves other part of the body and definitely these other complications may have some bearing as far as dme management is concerned and there are a whole lot of systemic conditions which can have uh, effect on diabetic macular edema and the way we treat it coming to the first one that is glycemic control and diabetic macular edema uh, there are evidences which are very differing between uh, whether there is a role of glycemic control in achieving a good response of a anti vegf the studies which were done couple of years back the protocol i rise ride they didn't find any association of hba1c and the treatment response however the newer studies the protocol t vista vivid they all found that there is a response as far as the oct thickness reduction is concerned it is dependent on hba1c levels that means for a better control of diabetes you can get a better response of your anti vegf which anti diabetic drug is best for dme all are good there is no extra benefit of one uh, agent over other today however one must realize that whenever you initiate the treatment of type 1 diabetes with insulin or whenever they, you switch from uh, oha oral hypoglycemic agents to insulin in type 2 there will be worsening of retinopathy and especially in type 2 diabetes when this switch is done nearly all of them will show some progression of retinopathy and even there can be progression of diabetic macular edema however in the long run it reduces the progression of retinopathy and there are two terms which are very commonly used whenever we speak about uh, dme and or or diabetic retinopathy and glycemic control a uh, metabolic memory and legacy effect so these were basically the follow up study in, in type 1 it was dcct study which were followed up later and they found that the group who had a intensive treatment in the dcct trial if after that the trial was stopped but still they had a protection so even in the later part there was a protection for diabetic retinopathy the same thing was seen in the uk pds population the group which had a intensive control showed some amount of protection even later on after 10 years so this ukpds called it as a legacy effect and the dcct called it as a metabolic memory this is something which is seen with glycemic control this highlights uh, early well controlled diabetes is something which will give a protection for diabetic retinopathy for a longer time one must also remember one of the drug tolazine dion that is glutazione's glutazones they also cause macular edema so people who have uh, on glutazone especially if they are also on insulin these are the people who develop macular edema and these are the cases you need not treat with anti vegf just stop the drug the macular edema will go off now what i spoke initially was more about the success rate or how the uh, glycemic control can influence your treatment coming to the safety part the uk guidelines they suggest that hba1c less than 8.5 should be there before you give intravitreal injections in india we don't follow hba1c but it is the random blood sugar less than 200 definitely there is advantage of using hba1c however we know the cost and the second biggest problem is if hba1c is more we need to probably wait for 3 4 months that again is a little problem and giving a intravitreal injection with a higher hba1c medical legally how it will uh, stand is a big question so just a suggestion in our the sar guidelines probably we should consider hba1c as an important parameter for managing diabetic macular edema but for safety we can still go ahead using the random blood sugar uh, coming to the next uh, systemic factor that is hypertension 
many times it's very difficult to differentiate if a person has because hypertensive retinopathy also presents with quite similar features as non proliferative diabetic retinopathy however if we feel see more of cluster of microaneurysms in the macular area we have intra retinal hemorrhages or a venular dilatation they are more towards diabetes and if you have more arteriolar changes more cotton wool spots or intra retinal hemorrhages which are flame shaped you more think towards hypertensive but there is always and there is always uh, this mixture of a mixed retinopathy where you have both diabetic and hypertensive changes is morphology different in hypertensive as far as dme is concerned yes to some extent uh, hypertension is uh, inversely associated to macular thickness in the macular subfields and it's also inversely related to choroidal thickness higher blood pressure people have a thinner choroid and in our uh, cohort we have shown that it is a independent risk factor for neurosensory detachment so on oct if you see nsd always look at the blood pressure has bp control any influence on dme treatment there are reports which have shown that it is the pulse pressure which is so you may have uh, spontaneous variations in the macular thickness in dme especially if there is a wide pulse pressure so always look into the bp whenever you are because many times we treat based on the central subfield thickness and definitely blood pressure control has got a beneficial effect in reducing the incidence of uh, diabetic retinopathy and progression of retinopathy however bp control has no metabolic memory as we have seen with glycemic control regarding the response of treatment there are no definitive studies but mead study which was with ozodex it did show that when there was no hypertension they had better visual acuity gains and if they had more number of antihypertensive medications meaning that the bp was more strictly controlled they had better uh, reduction in the central retinal thickness so coming again to the safety part of blood pressure what is the safe level of bp to give a intravitreal injection one must understand this term of hypertensive urgency where there is a severely elevated bp more than 180 110 to 180 120 without any sign of end organ damage and it's important to recognize this because the mortality it has a 2% risk of mortality in next 4 years the surprising fact which is there in the literature that 20 to 30% of the people experience hypertensive urgency during injection and the risk factors they found were the discomfort of the last injection and high systolic blood pressure so i think it's important to Uh, maintain uh, this bp before, or less than this bp when you are trying to uh, treat with a intravitreal injection so uh, again looking at guideline part probably a systolic of less than 180 diastolic 110 should be good again it's questionable whether you should monitor the blood pressure but if possible definitely it would be a good idea during injection the next systemic problem are the renal problems many of them they have coexist in nephropathy and the first question comes that whether the macular edema is different and many of us i would uh, know i'm sure you will all agree that many times these patients with nephropathy come with a ischemic maculopathy they have massive exudation they have more peripapillary cotton wool spots which gives us a clue that they probably have a coexisting nephropathy on oct usually they also present with a neurosensory detachment either a plain neurosensory detachment or sometimes you will have a diffuse edema with a neurosensory detachment uh is it safe to use intravitreal anti vegf yes it is safe but these are the recent nephrology guidelines which suggest that during a follow up of a patient who is on a intravitreal injection if there is a increase in the blood urea nitrogen and creatinine more than 25% probably you should switch the anti vegf because it is now there is concerns about the nephrotoxicity of anti veg of anti vegfs especially in diabetics uh, how reliable are the oct thickness we know they have more of edema so uh, one thing is in the stages the chronic renal disease stage 1 2 and 3 of the chronic kidney disease the oct parameters are pretty similar to any diabetic macular edema however later stages you have more thinning especially the re- inner retinal thinning is seen especially in patients of ckd uh, 
because normal diurnal variation is about 11%, in these patients, the diurnal variation is much more. So probably you should not just look into the OCT thickness while treating diabetic uh, patients. Dialysis has also got an effect. Hemodialysis predominantly moves the fluid blood flow from the choroidal to the inner retinal layers. And dial the uh, again, it's very conflicting reports as far as literature is concerned. But uniformly, what they have found that after the first dialysis, definitely the thickness reduces. And in a case of a nephropathy, who is you are giving anti VEGFs, it's good to plan the dialysis after intravitreal anti VEGF so that you can wash away any systemic absorbed drug too. So, extremely apologies. Uh, yeah, just three, four slides more. Okay, thank you. So, the uh, as far as effect of transplant, we had a large series from Shankaraitwale where we showed a twelve-year follow-up that it stabilizes diabetic retinopathy. Again, if there is combined renal pancreas transplantation, there will be a, a, a quick hypoglycemic episodes, and they may have worsening of retinopathy, as I had mentioned. Which marker to look for renal parameters? So this is, again, a huge series with MV diabetes we had analyzed. And what we found that for PDR, EGFR is an important factor. And for my diabetic macular edema, it is urine albumin and creatinine ratio. Uh, I'll not go in much details, but because time is short, but yes, those who have DME itself is one of the factor which predisposes people have more than two times more risk of uh, heart disease. But however, if a person has a recent stroke, how recent? Three months is the thing. And if he had prior uh, episode also, he should inform to the uh, physician. Anemia itself is one of the risk factors for diabetic macular edema. And uh, erythropoietin is a double-edged thing. It can improve diabetic macular edema, but it can worsen proliferative retinopathy. And this is something which many of the patients with CKD, because of renal-associated anemia, they are on. So this is something that one, one must look for. I'll not go in this. Yes, uh, as far as lipids, lipids are important. There are OCT parameters. Just last two slides. I'll just quickly go. Infections, don't inject. Keto diet, bariatric procedures, there is a quick reduction. Again, there is worsening of DME. Sleep apnea is an independent risk factor for DME. And uh, especially refractory DME, don't hesitate getting a sleep study done. Many times they have severe OSA. That may be the contributory factor. So just in to conclude, it's the not only an ophthalmologist, but probably a diabetologist, nephrologist, all working together, taking care of glycemic control, hypertension, lipids, nephropathy, anemia. These all are very crucial as far as a successful management of DME is concerned. Thank you very much.